Laura McNaughton is our managing director at Duff and Phelps, a firm that we work with very closely and, and have great respect for. And we're uh, delighted to have her participation today as the moderator and the lead in a discussion around this, this prevailing term of strategic alternatives. Um, and what does that really mean as we look at the structure of deals that may involve a corporate buyer or may involve a private equity firm or a family office? And as one debates and considers strategic alternatives, I think it's important to understand on both sides of the transaction how those are viewed and how those deal terms may play out differently, how the process may look differently. And so Laura has agreed to uh, uh, lead us through a discussion. And uh, with that, um, I'm going to have Laura introduce the rest of the panel uh, and get us underway. So thanks for being here. Welcome. Thanks, William. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. So Laura McNaughton, I'm a managing director at Duff and Phelps. I represent our business services industry practice uh, under the mergers and acquisitions umbrella, and I have 17 years of experience in representing middle market businesses in sale transactions. We're very excited uh, to have a great panel here with us today, and I'll just let the team introduce themselves. Good morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here today. Uh, Adam Sheridan, uh, director of corporate development at CC Industries. CCI is the holding company for the Crown family. Uh, we have eight portfolio investments uh, and looking to continue to grow that portfolio at all times. Um, been there for 11 years before that, was with Brunswick Corporation, uh, public NYC company or in their M&A group working on kind of recreational products uh, acquisitions and investors. Good morning, Mike Worth. I'm with a uh, private equity company called Mason Wells. We're headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, we're uh, currently holding uh, 13 portfolio companies. We're on our fourth fund. It's a $615 million fund. We're, uh, we're very focused on Midwestern-based acquisitions. And uh, prior to, uh, to my two years at Mason Wells, I worked for a company called Rockwell Automation. I was on the uh, corporate M&A side. Happy to be here today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Christophe Janin. I'm uh, with a company called Dover Corporation. Um, it's a uh, publicly traded, diversified manufacturing or diversified industrials company about $8 billion in revenues, about uh, 27 operating companies uh, throughout the, the corporation, organized around four segments. And for one of the segments called the fluid segments, I'm responsible for M&A and uh, strategy. Uh, I've been with Dover for about a year. Prior to that, I spent about 17 years with a management consulting firm here downtown called the Keystone Group, where we did M&A strategy and turnaround for distressed companies. And shockingly enough, Dover was one of my longtime clients. Happy to be here. So with that, we'll dive into some of the questions, but please feel free to keep this interactive if you have any questions along the way for the panel. Um, but just starting here with, with Adam, so with valuation multiples at historically high levels, what does it take to be successful in, a, in an acquisition process, and how do you differentiate yourself uh, as a buyer? Okay. Got it. Um, great. Yeah, so... Um, Obviously, it's been a very active market over the last few years. You know, for the, for our approach, you know, I can speak to that. You know, we've essentially really focused on, on what we know. You know, our, our portfolio. That's that's where our focus is. But essentially, you know, if we don't have an angle or a thesis coming in, if we're not preempting a transaction, we're really not spending time on it. You know, there is more activity in the market than we've ever seen. You know, today. So I think we view ourselves. If we're just getting a teaser. You know, coming in cold, if it's a space that even if it's great, if it's got a great team, if we don't have a thesis, if we, if we don't have that expertise in-house uh, before that, you know, we're not spending time. So as you kind of look at us, really over the last 12 to 24 months, you know, the theme has been an internal focus, focusing on what we do know. That's the port codes, uh, that's investing in an add-on strategy, uh, and that's taking things even more strategic. That's capital investments, that's human capital. Where else can we drive value where we think we have the highest return? Where is our expertise already? Um, you know, there is instances where we are looking, you know, we're still actively looking at new platforms, but if we haven't spent time, there's not an existing thesis. You know, if we don't have someone that's been in that space, it's gonna be really challenging for us to get over the goal line and put capital to work uh, with a new platform, at least with pricing where it is today. Yeah, I'm not sure if it... <clears throat> so I, I, I'd echo uh, a lot of what Adam said. I, I think the, uh, in markets like this, uh, I think a lot of people have, including myself, you have the, uh, the tendency to, uh, to get frustrated, right? I mean, there are 
as a buyer, it's, it's extremely, extremely uh, challenging, especially to participate in an auction process. So I would say, um, you know, to, to tag on to what Adam had, had mentioned, you got to find an angle. You got to find a, a differentiator that um, you're able to exploit to, to win a process. And, uh, you know, we've done three deals in our, our most recent fund, which, which closed about a year and a half ago. Uh, two out of the three were proprietary, we're, we're happy to say. So it's a matter of trying to preempt the process, right? Get, getting in there through long-term relationships and networking and, and, and demonstrating to a seller that you really are the preferred buyer, right? And there's many ways to do that. Uh, the simplest is by listening, right? What, what does that seller value other than cash? And sometimes the answer is nothing, but, and, and those are the tough ones to com compete against, frankly, right? Uh, but, but more often than not, you'll find there are other intangibles that you can, um, you can use to your advantage um, to win over a deal. I mean, a good example would be you know, a deal that we were participating in, a, in an auction process recently. Um, we were able to differentiate ourselves as being the, you know, the friendly Midwestern private equity company versus the, you know, the big, bad New York private equity company, which uh, I'll tell you is, is very important when, uh, when the, uh, you know, the, the next generation of leadership will be staying with the firm for the next seven, eight, ten years and reporting into that private equity company every, you know, every week, every quarter, every year. And uh, you know, that was a scenario where we did not have the highest uh, bid, but we won the deal, right? And, and that's, you know, that doesn't happen all the time, clearly, but if you can differentiate yourself through means uh, such as we were able to do, uh, you know, I think that's, that's what you gotta do in this market because every, you know, every turn counts, as we all know. And uh, you know, we keep saying maybe it's gonna, net, maybe it's gonna turn you know, next year, next month, and you know, here we are four or five, six years into it, and uh, you know, it's still going strong. So basically what, what they said, <laughs> um, just a little bit of background maybe. So for Dover, you know, we've been at this for 60 years. Uh, Dover started in 1955, has grown through acquisitions. So one of the things we offer, I think, which is a little bit unique, and we, we've often won deals where we're not the highest bidder. And what the sellers will tell us after the fact is we seem like a really good partner for them longer term. And what, I think what we provide, one, there's the culture. You talked about you know, Midwest, uh, some strong values. Um, we, we like entrepreneurial spirit throughout our company, even though we're $8 billion in revenues. If you think about it, we're really made up of small, true middle market companies, and that's what we look for. What we, what we offer the sellers, I think, is we offer access. It's access to markets. So we just closed a deal in January, a small European company. They reached out to us initially. They were looking for a commercial agreement to help them penetrate the Asian market. We're in Asia across many of our opcos, so we have access to the Asian market. Um, we also did a deal where a uh, U.S. company wanted to access the European market, same kind of thing. We can help with different channels where we're in today, where the company is not. Uh, we also provide access to capabilities and capacity, whether it's manufacturing. If they're really looking to grow, maybe they don't have enough manufacturing capacity. We do. And then we also provide access to capital. So a lot of our sellers have longer term growth goals that they share with us. And usually, whether it's coming from a private equity firm uh, or, or um, a, a strategic seller, um, they'll share with us the list of targets they'd like to look at. They just don't have the wherewithal to, to fund that, whereas we do. So we're not looking for just a standalone acquisition. We're looking for an acquisition we can bolt on to an existing operating company where we know a lot about that market. It needs to be a creative. It needs to be an attractive market that we've already identified. So similar to what you were saying, uh, before we spend any time, our management team needs to have a thesis that says, here's why we're interested. Um, and then we're looking to continue to add to that operating company, to that business with uh, you know, more bolt-on acquisitions down the road. So I think we provide that as well. And then the last piece, um, because we have a buy and hold strategy, we're not a private equity firm, I think sellers look to us, and there's some cases where they just want the cash and they want to get out, and that's okay. Uh, in a lot of cases, they want to stick around to grow the business, and they also look to Dover for other career opportunities. You know, we have 20, 29,000 people uh, all over the globe. We have 27 operating companies, and we move people around constantly. So I think we do offer some, some pretty cool career opportunities that they may not, may not otherwise have, either for the sellers, for their management teams, or for anybody really on their team. 
Adam, and maybe for you, uh, clearly one of the differentiating factors at CCI is that you're a family office. And we've seen uh, an increase in family offices direct investing. Uh, according to Forbes, it's, it's nearly doubled over the last five years compared to the prior five-year period. So what do you view as really those key advantages for direct investing versus having the family just invest through other private equity funds? Yeah, uh, of course. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think family office is definitely in the news much more today than it ever has been. You know, when I joined the, the family 11 years ago, you know, we were almost brought forward in every transaction we bid on. You know, so we, we want our private equity, we want our publics, and then there's this other category. No one really know what, knew what to think, like, about a family office. You just kind of, you were other. Uh, today, we're not differentiated in, 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 the, in the same way. You know, we're not the only family, you know, bidding on a deal. So, um, you know, as you think about, you know, why is it growing? You know, just, you know, wealth creation, diversification. But as you think about the, you know, what we're doing, it's playing the long game. You know, you know, similar to, you know, what was mentioned, you know, the family dates itself back to 1919. So 100 years, you know, kind of now in the fifth generation. And I think, you know, what is the benefit of, of permanent capital? And that's, you know, playing the long game, thinking of a longer term strategy, you know, investing and, you know, it might not pay off day one, but you have that kind of opportunity over the longer term, you know. So, you know, for us, uh, we're investing in people. You know, we're, we're, we're in the people business because of that. It's what these guys said, it's, it's cultural fits. If you say there's two things, if there's culture in a business, I, I, I take culture and management, you know, over, the, over the business all, all day. So, if, you know, for us, we're really trying to find those right situations where it's someone uh, that's looking for the right steward. You know, you know we'll, we'll buy from private equity. I think most of our businesses have come from private equity or publics, but you know, multi-gen families looking for good stewards. You know, concern that you know they don't want their business to leave their hometown. You know, that they've done a lot philanthropically and they don't want that to change. You know, dad did this, and it's something that's important. That's something I think we're a really good fit and appreciate. You know, because I think you know we're looking to you know back people. And, you know, it, it's just the, the control over time, getting back to your question. I think, you know, it's having the long game, you know, being able to say, hey, there's a business that we invested in, we're excited about. We want to hold it more than three to five or, you know, five to ten years. This could be, you know, the, the longest held asset is, uh, you know, 30 years in the portfolio. As you think about the legacy, the, the business that, uh, that uh, Henry Crown founded, it is still an investment of the family today, 100 years later. So. You know, that flexibility to play the long game and some of the benefits that come with that perspective is something that I think, uh, you know, is, is unique and, uh, you know, has helped kind of people start to think about, okay, I want to have that control of more direct investing. Great. Something else that's been in the news is just the recent changes to the tax code. So directing this question over to, to Christoph, you know, the current administration passed what's been called the most significant change to our tax code in 30 years. So do you expect these changes to impact your acquisition strategy at Dover, and if so, how? So obviously, I think in general, uh, there will be some, some uh, impacts to M&A. Um, cash sitting outside the U.S. can be used for acquisitions. Uh, lower tax rates, higher cash flow, that might impact valuation. So there's a lot of changes that could happen. I think for, for Dover, uh, because we have a buy and hold strategy, we are looking at the long term. Uh, we're, we're pretty rigorous in terms of what we look for. And our acquisitions need to fit strategically. It's got to be in a very attractive market where we have a current presence. We've got a management team that knows what they're doing. And so because we're looking at it over the long term, I don't think that the tax changes will impact us directly in terms of which deals we do versus we don't do. Now, I know that the corporate team downstairs had to update the Excel model we use to reflect some of the tax changes, but that's really the only you know, significant change for us. If you're looking out you know, 10, 20 plus years to hold on to, to an asset, I don't know that's gonna change significantly what we choose to invest in and what we don't. Yeah, I would just add that, um, so we, we've been called on probably 30 times since the, uh, the passage of the, the new act, and uh, it seems like half of the accounting firms We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll advise one thing and then the other half are still you know, advising another. So it, I, I think there's still a lot of ambiguity out there uh, in terms of the details, but from what we're able to piece together, you know, there's four or five kind of major shifts. And from our analysis, um, you know, again, we're, we're more midterm, you know, call it seven to, to 10 year holds. Um, we think there's more positive right now than negative. Um, you know, the biggest, I think, concern for us is we look out past three years is the, uh, the limits on interest deductibility. 
Right now, it's, I believe, 30% of, of EBITDA, and that will change to 30% uh, of EBIT. And for, uh, for highly leveraged transactions or even modestly leveraged transactions, there could be a real impact on the, uh, the deductibility of interest, uh, especially after the, uh, the change takes place in 2021. And you know, who knows what will happen in the next three years. But uh, I would say right now more, more positives with the, uh, the lower uh, tax rate as well as the, uh, the ability to, um, uh, to deduct uh, CapEx up front. Uh, th those are the big wins. And uh, you know, on the negative side is the, the interest concern. Yeah, ba basically ditto what these guys said. I mean, I mean, for us playing the long, long game, it's all about cash flow. You know, cash, cash, cash. So you know, our, our biggest metric is cash flow yield on, a, on an annual basis. And you know, every, everything that Mike just said, you know, with both depreciation and tax rates going down, we're seeing benefits there. Absolutely. Great. Right. Uh, there's also been an increase in our processes of operating partners. So private equity and family offices and the like uh, bringing in operating partners to try and help garner that angle when looking at an acquisition. So I'll just start with, with um, Adam here. Do you guys use operating partners? And, and if so, you know, how do you bring them in? When do you bring them in? And how have they been successful in making acquisitions? Yeah, absolutely. So we don't have the traditional operator and residence model. I would say our group, we have eight investment professionals. We'll call the group primarily reformed investment bankers mm -hmm. or transition uh, corporate finance professionals. Um, that, you know, as we talk about our, our role, you know, continue to wear that operational hat, so, so get that bent. But no, we don't have that traditional executive in residence. You know, what we do have is we don't centralize, but we have a whole co, and we, we leverage those individuals uh, when we're looking at transactions, and then we leverage our portfolios. We leverage those eight poor co's. You know, we think for the most part, you know, we stay in, in our lane, areas we know. So there's usually an executive that's had that experience. So we have a good network within our companies. We know the experiences that we have, kind of the experts. So we really kind of pull on that to, to pull out the subject matter experts from our portfolios to kind of put together our best internal team uh, when we're looking at deals. But kind of as I said at the beginning, our uh, mandate or what we do is, is we back existing teams. So we don't... Um, you know, bring in an executive and find a business for them or bring in or buy a business and then try to transition the leader or the CFO. That's kind of not our model. You know, we're looking to kind of back existing teams that, um, that are running, you know, high-performing businesses. Yeah, very similar to, to what Adam mentioned. Um, at Mason Wells, we, we do also do not have your, your more conventional um, operating partner and residence model. We... Um, we rely on our portfolio companies, and we also uh, rely very heavily on our informal network of operating partners. Uh, some of those individuals uh, are investors in our funds. Some of those are uh, kind of friends of, of the firm, if you will. Uh, some of these individuals become outside board members on our portfolio companies. And uh, I would say it's absolutely critical to, um, you know, to have that network, whether it's internal within your portfolio companies or within your corporation or whether it's external, because um, that's, that's what's going to differentiate you when it comes down to, uh, to time to, to make an educated uh, bid. You know, if you're able to walk in as a buyer and uh, y you can prove you've done your homework, it, it goes a long way, right, versus coming in with a checkbook. So, um, you know, that's probably my first call after we, uh, we get an opportunity that we're interested in. It's not to the bank, it's to our operating partners to learn more about the space, to get their perspective and their angle. Uh, to better inform myself as to how we should be positioning, uh, you know, our team to support uh, making the best the best uh, bid that we possibly can. And then for for Christoph, we'll jump to just the next topic, which revolves around due diligence. Which um, you've given kind of the high valuation multiples being paid in today's market. The offset to that seems to be the extensive level of diligence that buyers are conducting, and this has gone beyond just your standard accounting quality of earnings analysis to include things like industry studies um, on down to examinations of cybersecurity threats. And we'll see small middle market businesses and the, the buyer might have six or seven outside advisors guiding them through exhausted lists of diligence questions. In theory, a strategic buyer might require less diligence because they have a base understanding of the industry and the market segment. Um, but want to get Christoph's thoughts on that just from a practical perspective and understand what are the critical components of your diligence process once you identify an asset that you do want to acquire. So 
I'll start by saying, you know, we've identified across our four segments, we have about eight or nine growth platforms. And so whenever we start looking at a potential asset, it needs to fit within one of those growth platforms. And we have existing operating companies, existing management teams, so we do know something about the businesses we go after. Typically, we have existing relationships with the management team or with the owners or with a private equity firm. Uh, having said that, being a publicly traded company, you know, I, I kind of wish the due diligence process was a bit shorter and easier. Um, but you know, we have to we have to seek approval from our CEO and CFO. We have to go in front of the board uh, for larger deals. So we do have to check a lot of boxes. Um, but because of our experience doing M&A, and to give you a sense, since 2008, I think we've closed on about 57 transactions at Dover. So we do have a pretty good uh, process in place where we know exactly here's a list of data we want. Uh, here's how we're going to structure our teams internally to do the due diligence. Shockingly, we look at financial diligence. You mentioned QE. We look at commercial diligence, operational diligence, and we try to look at culture. And as part of our due diligence, we uh, very early on in the process, we look at synergies. Uh, because without synergies, it's a bit harder to get a sense of how will we create value and what makes us a better owner of that asset. Um, in terms of what we do internally versus externally, uh, we really do rely on our management teams uh, to do a lot of the work. Uh, I will help them. Uh, we've got a few corporate guys who can also help. But at the end of the day, the leadership team of our existing operating companies are the ones who will own the asset. They'll, they're the ones who will have to deliver on the, the deal model. And what we do is for the first two years, uh, every month, we have a call with the team and we go through the deal model versus actuals. And we try to see how are we doing and why are we behind, where are we ahead, what else can we do to, to create some more value. Um, we're not shy about bringing in third parties. And that would be things like, um, I think pretty typical, um, uh, Q of E will bring in outside firm. Uh, environmental, because it's uh, manufacturing, we'll bring in an outside firm. Uh, if we have a lot of uh, IP to review, we've got our own uh, legal team, but we'll typically bring in an outside firm. So really look, look for specialties where somebody who does that every day, uh, 12 hours a day, is a better person than, than our team internally. Um, and then when we do an acquisition that's a bit further from the core, so it's more of an adjacency, we will also reach out very early on and look for some sort of market assessment, market research, as well as trying to access, and there's some good firms out there, trying to access experts, so subject matter experts, about a technology, about an industry, about a specific geography, and we'll do calls with them or meetings with them to really quickly get up to speed on some very specific topics we just need to get smarter about. So for those kinds of things, we'll absolutely reach out to, uh, to third parties. Uh, you mentioned like due diligence checklist or something like that. Um, in a typical process, will you, you know, do you find that itself will have maybe two sets of lists, like one pre exclusivity and then another one, you know, after you've got exclusive with more, you kind know, of weeds type stuff? Or how do you do that? So I'll say two things. Obviously, there's on the tail end, there's the confirmatory due diligence. Once we get to that, our mind's pretty much made up. So that, that's what, what we intend. We, we intend to be sure that we're just confirming stuff, but we're ready to go. What we will do is when we start with the uh, EOI, so well before the LOI, uh, just an expression of interest, internally at least, our team already has a deck put together, including the financial model, um, assumptions around synergies, um, without necessarily having a lot of data from the company, from the target company. So we start that process pretty early on, and we try to get as much information early on as we can. One of the things we try to do is we try to fail quickly. Mm -hmm. So if something doesn't quite look right, yeah. if it feels like we're not mm -hmm. going to meet some of the uh, hurdles that we're, we're looking to, to clear, we'd rather pull out early and not, not, not waste our time. You know, the deal flow, I think we'll talk about that maybe a bit later on, but we, we've been pretty active, and we see a lot of businesses. A lot of those come through our operating companies where the management team knows people in their industry, and they bring those deals up. A lot of transactions come through our corporate guys where they deal with both investment bankers, with private equity guys, who bring, you know, bring us deals as well. So, so we're pretty busy. We have to be able to pick and choose pretty carefully and pretty quickly. Otherwise, we, we, you know, I'm a team of one. Downstairs, we've got two to three guys, and that's it. And our management teams are busy running their businesses also. So we try to get as much as we can up front. 
Micah, from a diligence perspective, anything to, to note how that compares to what you do at Mason Wells or how it's different? Yeah, you know, a lot of, a lot of similarities that Christoph mentioned, very, very well put. Um, I would say the one huge difference for me coming from a similar role with a, a large public going to uh, go into private equity was the amount of outside resources we have to rely upon. So the, uh, you know, the budget for di diligence obviously goes up tremendously. Um, you know, we're, we're in a quarterback position where you're, you're quarterbacking and, and monitoring and motivating all of your, your, your army of external, you know, could be 10, 20 uh, outside resources. And, uh, you know, thankfully not all publics are as, as well oiled as Dover, right? I mean, Dover's been doing M&A for a long time and, and they're very good at it. Uh, fortunately, there's many corporations that are not. And one of our, you know, one of private equities and family offices for that matter, one of our core competencies or our competitive advantages is we're quick, right? We can close a deal in 45 days with an exhaustive due diligence process. Um, I don't know many corporations, you know, I, Dover would be one, like I said, of the few that, that probably could, but there are many that would take six months to get to where we can in, in you know, two. So, uh, but at the same time, we're, we're not sacrificing, you know, the quality of the due diligence. We're just doing it really, really quick, and we're bringing in a, a, an army of outside resources. Uh, the market study is an interesting one. Uh, we always do a market study. Uh, some are more exhaustive than others. And we always do um, customer surveys, which, again, was a change from what I was used to at corporate. Um, there are companies out there that specialize in customer surveying. You know, and it's, it's typically the top 10 or 20 or maybe 30 customers um, you're surveying those customers on behalf of the seller, and they're putting together a, a very nice, um, very detailed report on what the company does well, where, you know, opportunities for improvement, and, and other commentary. And ultimately, you're boiling that down into you know, net promoter scores. And, uh, and then that gets translated, assuming we go forward with the deal, which we typically do, that gets translated into your 90-day, you know, 100-day integration plan, and we expect to address those shortcomings you know, early on within the uh, within our hold of, of that company. So uh, that'd be one thing I would add is the, the customer surveys. Mike, on that front, on the market studies and the customer surveys, uh, when in the process are those typically being completed? Yeah, you know, that's typically um, that's typically at the at the exclusivity phase. So once we uh, once we get to an LOI, uh, we we start to really incur the expenses. Uh, so early on, right, with an indication, we're trying to limit our exposure uh, in terms of bringing on outside parties. Um, but once we get LOI, you know, that's typically 30 to 45 days um, before close. We'll be ramping up with the studies. And uh, again, that can be challenging because if you're doing an exhaustive market study that, you know, they're going to ask for two months. Well, we're going to try, we're going to try to get it done in, in one. Uh, so typically you end up, you know, working in phases. So give us a, you know, give us a first read in, in 30 days and then follow up in 45 with, with more details. Um, the sooner, the sooner you can start that uh, process, the better. And to the extent that a, an outside party has done similar research in the past, you know, perhaps it's for us, perhaps it's for another client, uh, they're often able to leverage that as a starting point so we're able to get to the end uh, a heck of a lot quicker. Have yes, ever killed a deal based on the results of market study? Uh, it's the question is, have we ever, have we ever killed the, it is, have we ever killed a deal based on the results of the market study? Not, not to my knowledge, but we have certainly used that market study to, to refine the synergy story behind the deal and, uh, and, and to inform the integration plan. But you know, in terms of killing a deal, we'd have, you know, typically we, we know high level the trends, right? What's the market size look like roughly? Uh, what's the growth rate? And uh, you're really refining it with the market study by region, by product offering, you know, by end market. So uh, I'd say it's more to, to fine tune the plan, not necessarily a, a go, no go decision at that point. Just one thing I, I wanted to add. Um, before you spend a lot of time with due diligence, you know, we ask our operating companies, regardless of where the deal came from, whether they brought it up, it came from corporate, it came from a private equity firm or investment banker, part of our strap plan, it's a three-year rolling strap plan, we have a market map of mm -hmm. their global market, and we ask them, so this acquisition that you just brought up, where does it fit? And was it on your list of potential things you want to do? Because if the answer is, no, nah, we hadn't really thought about that, and we immediately ask them, well, you better come up with an answer quickly because if, if we don't have an existing thesis, we're not sure we want to spend the time going through a whole lot of yep. due diligence. It's going to mean we need to do some sort of market mm -hmm. research quickly because we have to get smarter about it. And we'd much rather focus on areas where the operating companies have already determined that there are certain segments where they want to invest more and, and be a, a larger competitor. Uh, so we try to do that to then justify moving forward with some due diligence. 
And I say for us, you know, we're ultimately a hybrid probably of the private equity and, and public company approach. I would say, you know, similar to Christoph in, in Dover, we're really, as we've talked about, kind of leveraging what we have in-house. The SMEs at the Porcos, our experts at the uh, corporate uh, level, you know, what does that allow us to do? Move quickly and, you know, maintain costs. You know, people that know how we think, people that know how the, you know, what our hot buttons are. So. As Mike said, I think moving fast, you know, is an advantage. You know, in the past we've had transactions. You know, we submitted a preliminary IOI, and they said, okay, if we can get this done and close on this day, because I want to announce it as part of my, you know, Q3 earnings call, the deal is yours. You know, we we push forward, hit the button, everyone's off and running, and, and you know, we, we've gotten it done. I'd say the other benefit that we have is, you know, thinking about transition services. Having that whole co, you know, having that bench, um, doing it already with our operating companies allows us to perhaps step into, I want to say a hairier situation, but a carve out where there's more needs than a business that's independent already. So I think um, speed, versatility, uh, and then kind of leveraging what we have, very similar to kind of what Christoph described. We're bringing in experts where we don't have it. I mean, you know, legal obviously from a contract standpoint, QV will do sometimes in-house, sometimes out of the house. I think it really depends on the size of the transaction. And then other experts, you know, as necessary. I have a question. So the one thing that I think would be interesting for you guys to discuss, so you have three very different buyers. Uh, you know, if you throw in the foreign buyer, we might have the whole gamut. Uh, you know, so three out of four. One, you know, all your purchase agreements are going to look pretty similar, but one thing that's going to differentiate substantially is your post-closing incentive models. Um, you know, I know some of, you know, I know for Adam it might be a little proprietary, um, but could you maybe talk about how that plays a factor into your, uh, you know, when you're when you're pitching to a company, you know why why they should choose you. You know I, the post closing incentive models I think are very different. And I think that's an interesting discussion. Yeah, absolutely. And good question, Scott. Um, yeah, as you indicated, you know, our, our view of how we approach it, you know, is proprietary. I think what we aim to do is, you know, we're aware of the market. So I think as the, the guys alluded to before, you know, ultimately, you know, we're trying to be a good steward and find the, the right business. Um, you know, cash at the end of the day, you know, is king. You know, people are looking for a purchase price. I think we've seen it on the margin, but usually it's purchase price. So, you know, if, if we're the right fit, you know, we want to be comparable, you know, with, you know, the people we're competing with, which is usually private equity and public companies. So, you know, we have a model that, uh, you know, looks to replicate something similar to, you know, what most public and private equity, you know, companies have. Um, so the executives are equally as excited, you know, both in terms of the long term, but as well as obviously, you know, their compensation kind of under the, the family model. Yeah, so the, the fun thing for me transitioning from corporate to private equity is this thing called, uh, called equity value creation, right? And it's the, uh, it's the ultimate alignment of, of resources and incentives, right? So, uh, you know, our investors are investing in our fund for value creation, right? We're, you know, our carry is based on value creation, right? And we also align the acquired company's leadership with that company's value creation. So, I mean, it, it's the perfect alignment of incentives across the board, which, which makes um, that piece of private equity really elegant and really simple, right? Um, you know, can't wait to hear Christoph's uh, answer because we struggled with it, right? I think a lot of public struggle with it. And especially if you have, uh, if you just wrote uh, a check for, you know, the $250 million to a seller, um, incenting that person to wake up and, and, and go to work, right, for $150,000 a year uh, becomes really, really challenging, especially if you want that person to become motivated. You can't throw enough money at a person necessarily uh, to keep them, you know, day to day, doing the daily, you know, uh, compliance training and FCPA training. And right? so, we, you know, we, we lose people all the time because uh, you just can't, they, they don't have skin in the game. Uh, we're able to not only provide, you know, equity incentives in the form of options, but if there's interest in enrolling over a percentage of their proceeds and, uh, you know, maybe it's 10%, right, and having another, quote, bite at the apple, um, that's a great model too, right? So take your $200 million and, and throw, throw $20 million back into the company as a direct investment and, uh, you know, let's, let's, you know, do five or six or seven times on, on that 20. Uh, it, becomes, it becomes meaningful. So uh, that's the fun part of private equity is that alignment of incentives. So when we do acquire a company, the, um, you know, the, the president of the acquired company 
will fall into Dover's you know, long-term incentive plan structure. Um, but I think what's really important is what you just mentioned. When you write a check, and I don't know what your experiences have been, guys, but when you write a check to an owner for $100 million, yeah. and we've had these discussions, let's do an earn out. Um, and so if you st it's either you know, a retention kind of thing. If you stay for five years, here's what you do. Or if the business hits certain milestones, you get an additional $5 million, $10 million. You know, the $100 million check is life-changing. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you have to rely on that earnout to retain and motivate that individual, then I think you've already lost him, and you better be ready with somebody to, to step in. So I, I'm personally not a big fan of earnouts. Um, you know, while I was a keystone, I, I, I worked with a lot of clients on transactions where there was an earnout. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, three young guys uh, sold their business. They were in their probably 31, 32 years old. Sold the software business. They each pocketed $5 million. But wait, we had an earnout. So if they stuck around for three years and hit certain milestones, they were going to get another million dollars each. Uh, they stayed a week. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, keep your million. Keep it, we're yeah. happy with our five. <laughs> so yeah. you can take that model yeah. and add exactly. a zero at the end of it or two zeros. It doesn't really change the fundamental issue. Yeah. So I'm not a big fan of earnouts. And, and again, if, if that's what is going to make a deal actually happen, I think we've got some, some other issues there. All right, maybe just touching upon time to exit. So we've talked a lot about when you're looking to acquire a business, but how do you really ascertain when it's time to exit an investment? And Mike, you're on a little more structured time frame for your investments, right. so right. how have you guys decided that at Mason Wells? Yeah, I'll take a shot at that. So Ma Mason Wells overall has um, a little more patient philosophy, and that's both on the front end as we prospect opportunities uh, and during our hold period. You know, there's companies that we've been talking to for 10, 15 years, um, developing relationships with the, uh, the ownership, and uh, you, know, you can't force someone to sell. When they're ready to sell, they'll sell, and usually it happens pretty quick, so you have to be ready to, to receive that phone call. Uh, during our hold period, our average hold is seven and a half years, which is, is pretty long for a private equity company. Um, some of our, our current portfolio companies we've held for 10, 11, I think one is 12 years, so um, the, the timing is quite variable. Um, when do we know when to sell? Uh, our internal saying with, within the firm is uh, we sell when management thinks it's time to sell because, again, we're, you know, we're, not, we're not running the business. We, we, we hold the business, we own the business, and we support the business. But um, when we have our, our CEO come to us and say, guys, we, we might want to think about you know, getting, uh, getting an investment banker involved, um, there's usually a, a very good reason for that. They see trends in the industry. They know that we're we're peaking out in some some uh, you know, some element, whether that's uh, just you know through a capex perhaps, or um, you know the the, uh, the industry dynamics are shifting. So we really take our lead from that that leadership team. Now, obviously, there has to be a well a well thought of, you know explanation behind it and justification for doing so. Uh, but um, you know that that's really a, a huge signal to us that yeah, it's probably it's probably time to start a process. So, a so, couple things. Um, and this has been announced publicly. So we are selling one of our four segments. We're actually spinning it uh, off. It's our well site or energy segment. So that's a big sort of sales process, much broader topic for, for another day. A um, little bit of context for Dover. Pre-2008, Dover was made up of about 60-plus operating companies, 6-0, across six segments. And as of last year, we're down to four segments. We're down to 27 operating companies. So there was a ton of really thoughtful pruning of our portfolio. Now, 2017 going forward, we do continue to look at either uh, companies that may not quite fit our portfolio now or our growth platforms, or uh, product lines that may not quite fit. And the way we determine this going forward after having sort of you know, restructured quite a bit in the past is, is the market still something we're excited about? And every year as part of the strap plan, we challenge each of our operating companies to show us how they can grow at about twice the rate of the market they're in. And if that starts to dry up and we can't beat the market, then we start to think about, you know, does this really make sense longer term? Is this an industry or sector we want to be involved with? Um, and, and that growth obviously is made up of acquisitions, but really importantly, it's really about organic growth. And can the business sustain that kind of growth 2x the market rate? m and is sort of on top of that. So that's how we try to, to, to look at that. Yeah, and 
very similar from our perspective. I think at inception or the time of investment, I mean, we don't think about exit. You know, as, as we talked about, we go into something thinking about this is, this is a long-term hold, values created through our synergies, our strategy, cash flow. It's not predicated on an exit. So we don't think about an exit at all in our calculus of whether we should do an investment or not. Um, you know, ult ultimately, yeah, I think two things will lead to us being a seller. You know, one of which is a lot of those market conditions that Christoph just described is what we look for. We look for market plus growth, you know, at attractive cash flow yields. And if that dynamic changes, that could change our calculus. I think the second is, you know, we try to be thoughtful and humble to say, you know, are we the best owner of this business? And if it reaches a point where it says, you know, we're not, you know, that's i.e., you know, we're not marketing, but if inbounds come in, there's, you know, someone that might be better positioned to be successful that we could either partner with or just frankly, they're, they're so differentiated that they would just be a better owner. Um, you know, that's a situation that we consider kind of, a, you know, on a situation by situation basis. All right, so we're coming up against the end of the session, but wanted to just check and see if there's any other questions from the audience. If not, we can go into a bit of a little speed round here. So Ooh. I'll ask two more questions, and you can just go down the row. Uh, the first of which is, if we had our crystal ball and we're looking ahead two years from now, do you think valuation multiples would be at, above, or below where they sit today? Uh, and the second is, who's going to win the World Series? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I like the second question better. Um, you, know, you know, who knows? We're not in the business of, of speculating. You know, so, so 24 months from now, you know, we hope for a good economy. We hope the business that we're investing in are, you know, doing really well. You know, putting my other hat on from a deal standpoint, yeah, I, I hope multiples come down. You know, the multiples have been a challenge. It's, it's driven creativity. So, um, yeah, I, I think we'll have more flexibility, you know, if we see multiples start to come down, you know, as we move into 2018 and 2019. And this is probably an unsafe answer in this room, but I, but I will put it out there. I, I hope the Brewers win the World oh. Series. Uh, <laughs> uh, fortunately for this room, I'm assuming it's a mostly Chicago room, I don't think there's a lot of concern about that. So <laughs> hopefully no one holds it against me. <laughs> you, you stole my answer on the World Series, but uh, it's hard to imagine multiples being much higher than they are today. Uh, but then again, I probably would have said that a year ago. Um, I just hope it's a, a, a calm and composed uh, correction, if you will. Uh, I agree, though, uh, to Adam's point, it has created uh, a lot of discipline and creativity within, industry, within the industry, which I think is a good thing, having multiples where they are today. Um, but yeah, if, if I had to place a bet, I, I, I don't think we can get all that much higher. What was the World Series? Brewers, of course. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if there's any sellers in the room or representatives of sellers, I would say multiples are going down. <laughs> um, That's right. You know, for, for, for Dover, one of the things we haven't talked about, so we're manufacturing. That's what we focus on. More and more, we're seeing IoT and technology come into play, and those multiples are quite different from a typical middle market manufacturing company. And there are some creative valuation techniques there. So unfortunately for Dover, Given where we're focused on, it is those um, highly profitable markets and the multiples have been going up. And what I'm seeing, at least now, for the next probably a little while, at least a couple of years, those multiples are going up for us in terms of the assets we're looking at. So as much as I'd love to say, you know, we can keep them where they are or bring them down, uh, the trends are going in the other, other directions based on what we're looking at. Um, Second question, I'm originally from France. There's no baseball in France, so <laughs> I, I don't care. I don't care. Great. Good answer. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Thanks to the panel this morning. Um, I thought it was a fun discussion. I hope you guys all enjoyed it as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.